Hello, everyone, and welcome to Post Podium, a podcast where former Jeopardy contestants are instead given questions and asked to provide answers. I'm your host, Jarek Bruel, and joining me today is Mike Janella, a sportscaster from Astoria, New York. Mike made his Jeopardy debut on April 7, 2022, but unfortunately lost to then two-day champion Matea Roach. Outside of the game, Mike is also an accomplished host, producer, and writer, and currently serves as a digital media and game day stadium host for the New York Mets. He's also worked for several other big name organizations, including Billboard News, The Hollywood Reporter, and The American Kennel Club, just to name a few. And to top it all off, in 2018, Mike appeared on the ABC revival of $100,000 Pyramid and won the top prize of $150,000. As you can tell, we have a lot of ground to cover when it comes to Mike, his background, and how it all points to Jeopardy. So as always, the following conversation will include spoilers from Mike's episode. So if you haven't watched Mike yet, I suggest you watch his episode first and save this podcast for later. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Post Podium. Okay, I think we're just about ready to record. Why don't we start with a simple introduction, your name, and when you made your contestant debut on Jeopardy, and how you finished. My name is Mike Janella. I made my contestant debut uh, and finale subsequently all on the same day, Thursday, April 7th, 2022, and I finished in second place. Perfect. And not to get ahead of myself, but the reason why I specified contestant debut for Mike is because this wasn't your first time on the Jeopardy stage. In fact, it was the subject of your contestant interview. For our listeners who might not have watched your episode, could you talk about when you first appeared on the show and why you were there? So back in the day, before I kind of, or in between uh, my hosting gigs throughout my career, I worked for Guinness World Records. Uh, that's the long and short of it. And I was, part of my job there was being an adjudicator, which is the, the million dollar word for records judge. And so we traveled the country and the world judging world record attempts and telling people if they did it or not. But also if someone had already broken a world record or set their own, we would go and present them in special circumstances with their Guinness World Records uh, certificate, their plaque. So uh, the late, the great, the amazing, we all loved him, Alex Trebek, uh, held the record. I believe he still does, actually, for the most episodes hosted of the same game show. So obviously he hosted a million Jeopardy episodes. It broke the record that Bob Barker had for Price is Right. And me, being a Jeopardy fan since I was literally three years old, you know, watching with my grandparents and my parents at dinner, uh, I just begged my bosses, like, you got to let me go out and, and present Alex with his certificate. And so uh, they let me go. And this was 2014, I think, spring of 2014. I got to go out there to Culver City, to the Jeopardy Studios. And it was actually during the filming of Tournament of Champions, which was incredible to sit there in the crowd and watch that, like getting a ticket to the Super Bowl. And then after the filming, or in between, I forget, uh, I got to sit down with Alex, got to present him with his certificate, which they ended up putting in the episode, which was really dope. I wasn't expecting that. And then I got to interview him afterward for a little Q&A uh, for GWR's uh, website and stuff. So yeah, that's, that was my first time on the Jeopardy set. And uh, I told Alex that day, man, I, I, this is great, but I'd love to come back and play someday. It's been a dream of mine. And he just told me, you know, keep at it. I think it'll happen for you someday. And it took a while, it took eight years, but uh, eventually it did. When you walk into the Jeopardy studio, I believe there is a long hallway of awards <laughs> yep. for the show and like trophies and plaques. Was the Guinness World Record one of those items? Did you manage to spot it in the display case? So unfortunately, because of COVID protocols uh, on our day, we weren't allowed to like go down that hallway. Uh, it was very like kind of cordoned off, but I was able to take a peek and I know that Alex had received a previous Guinness World Record certificate before the one I presented him, but we just like mailed at Jeopardy that one, and that was displayed there. So I can only assume and hope that mine is now having either replaced it since it was updated. I think he received another one after I gave him his, so maybe mine is altogether gone. So uh, I don't know. I think there is some GWR representation there somewhere, uh, whether or not it's mine exactly. Uh, if they ever invite me back to the show, then I'll go check it out, I guess, then uh, that time. And do you know how far off Pat Sajak is from surpassing Alex's record by chance? Great question, and I do not know the answer to that. Uh, I haven't kept up with my, uh, with my Guinness World Records uh, stats lately, but uh, I would assume uh, you know, in the next couple of years he'll probably get there. But yeah, I don't know the answer off the top of my head to that one. So usually when I do these interviews, I like to begin with the present by talking about your air date and watch party experience and then work my way backwards by going into the details of what you did before your taping date which I believe was January 27th. Is that correct? 
Uh, that's correct. That's right. So what was your watch party experience like? Did you keep it small with just your family? Maybe invite some close friends over? What was that experience like? Yeah, I kept it pretty tight. Uh, and originally it was crazy because I didn't know when I filmed, uh, and I worked for the New York Mets uh, primarily in the summer, and I didn't know with our schedule and baseball was in a lockout at the time when we filmed, if the Mets would be playing that night, if they'd be uh, home, if they'd be on the road. So it's kind of weird not knowing how that watch party experience was going to go. But in the end, uh, the way the schedule worked out, I was free to be at home. So I just had went to my parents' house because they're centrally located uh, in New Jersey to a bunch of people that I wanted to be there. So it was myself, my girlfriend, my parents, uh, my brother and his wife, my two grandmas, and then my godmother and, uh, and my uncle, her husband, uh, who were there, and my other uncle and his daughter, and my uncle's girlfriend. So now that I mention it, to me, like a small family thing ends up being kind of a big watch party. <laughs> yeah. But um, for us, that was a low-key thing. We do Thanksgivings with like 35, 40 people every year. So uh, it seemed low-key to me, but I guess it was a good amount of people. But yeah, I didn't want to go out to a bar or, or rent out a restaurant or anything like that. I wanted it to be as intimate as possible with the people that have known me my whole life and knew how much this meant to me. And uh, when I taped, my, my thought was, oh, the first night I'll do that. And then after I win game one, for game two, I'll go to a bar, invite all my friends, have it on all the speakers and the TV and stuff. Obviously, that didn't happen. But uh, yeah, I was happy to be able to share that moment, uh, thankfully, and be available for it with all the people that knew how much it meant to me. Before we get into the meteor questions or the main course of this interview, I want to serve you <laughs> a small appetizer first, Mike. Uh, it's a short question, but I'm sure it's packed with flavor. Uh, why Jeopardy? <laughs> I love asking this question because I know it'll be different for everyone. Did you grow up watching the show? Were you a precocious student? Is trivia a hobby for you? Share with us why you decided to be on Jeopardy. It's, a, it's an appetizer, but this is a this is a meaty question. This is like a, an order of mozzarella sticks or buffalo wings, like one of those serious appetizers. Yeah, for me, it's just it's been the show I, I've watched since I was a kid. I alluded to it earlier, but my earliest memories are literally. Before I even moved into my childhood home, my parents and I lived with my grandparents for like six months after we moved from out of state and were waiting to settle down. And I remember being at their house at dinner time, just watching Jeopardy. And my grandparents were all immigrants. And I think something about Jeopardy, I don't know, drew them in that kind of aspirational, like if you study hard enough and that whole American dream type thing for that generation. And someone like Alex Trebek, who was a Canadian that embraced being American and just like, you know, made people's dreams come true. And it, Jeopardy has all those values intrinsic to it, right? Hard work, preparation, strategy, uh, personality and charisma even, right? So they kind of loved it. And then me just being there, you know, I loved it. And I grew up to end up being a nerd in school. I was always a straight A's kid that was never playing any sports. Uh, didn't really get many girls' attention, wasn't really that popular, but I always crushed it. I was always on honor roll, dean's list, all that kind of stuff growing up. So for me, Jeopardy! was kind of that show that whereas other people would watch sports, and I would too, but I never saw myself after a certain young age as being someone that could potentially play in the major leagues or go to the Olympics or dunk a basketball. But I knew from a very early age, wow, maybe Jeopardy! is kind of my Olympics. That's what I could grow up to do is appear on that show because this is a show that celebrates smart people uh, at a time when my generation growing up like in the early to mid 90s being smart wasn't cool. And so for me, that was just something that always drew me to that show. And then as I grew older and wanted to get into hosting as a career path, someone like Alex, who was just the best of the best at it, became more of an idol to me than just an entertainment uh, thing every night. And so that just added that extra layer of what that show meant to me and watching it every night with my parents through dinner and my brothers and then getting to college and in our dorms every night at seven, we would get together and crack open some Bud Lights and watch Jeopardy. And it was just became part of, of my routine like it is for so many people. But for me, it's just been, like I said, over 30 years since I was a baby of that being the pinnacle of coolness of being smart, right? And that, that's, that's the way to be. So for me, it was always that and just trying to get on there as, as, as much as possible as a life goal. And now I got to do it. So uh, now I don't know what it's like when you chase the car and uh, as a dog and you finally catch it, what do you do? But yeah, that was my story. Just something I, that always it drew me in from, from the very beginning. For those new to this podcast or those who don't really know what the Jeopardy audition process entails, to get on the show, you need to pass two knowledge tests, a mock game of Jeopardy and a personal interview. You take the first knowledge test on Jeopardy's website, and if you pass it, you'll be invited to take a second knowledge test over Zoom. If you pass that test, you'll be invited to another Zoom to play a mock game of Jeopardy and interview with a contestant coordinator. 
Afterwards, you're in the contestant pool for the next 18 months, during which you could potentially be called in to be on Jeopardy. So Mike, walk me through your audition timeline. When did you take the anytime test? When did you take the second test over Zoom? When did you play your mock game and were interviewed? And finally, when did you receive the coveted call or text from the contestant department? Yeah, it's kind of a blur because, I mean, you can relate to this. Doing this during the pandemic age, time just kind of blurs. And I forget when exactly I took the anytime test. I think it was, uh, I want to say like early summer, late spring 2020, when we were all at home, like doing nothing. Uh, and I think, I want to say maybe, maybe June, something like that. And then I end up in September, uh, Labor Day weekend around, I think, getting the, the notice that I had surpassed that first threshold. And then that's when they invited me to that second test, like you said. And then that was, uh, I forget the timing on that exactly. It had to be a couple of weeks after that. So maybe late September, early October. And then it was May, 2021. So almost a year after taking the initial test that I got the call to do the, the Zoom gameplay slash uh, audition as well. And then that's when I was told that I was in the contestant pool, which they put you in for, I believe, up to 18 months. And then I was waiting uh, until, so I was May 2021, the end of May, beginning of June. Then I got uh, the text uh, January 6th of 2022. Uh, so that was, what, seven months later? Uh, the text to say, hey, we want to talk to you about your application. And I thought, oh, maybe they just have some follow-up questions. I don't think this is the call yet. Uh, but it was the call. Uh, I got the call later, chatted, and they said, hey, can you be here in three weeks? And I said, absolutely. I wasn't going to say no. Whatever, whatever date they offered me, I was going to you know, move mountains to, to get there. And so January 6th, I got the confirmation I'd be on. January 27th was my gameplay. So from, I guess, May 2020 until end of January 2022 was the all-in process from taking the very first uh, anytime test to showing up at, at hair and makeup. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Three weeks between when you got the text to when you taped. That's, that's insane. What was, it, what was it for you? Is it different it for, was, the, for this tournament? Yeah, it was one and a half months for me, actually. I remember I got the oh, text wow. and call uh, mid-September in the middle of my last semester and then yeah I, I, there wasn't like a specific like instance where they told me like hey you're gonna be on they we just like exchanged like information back and forth and eventually when we got into the weeds of things of like filling out paperwork via email that's when i was like okay this is probably this probably means i'm gonna be on the show because once they gave my trap once they gave me my travel itinerary i'm just like okay yeah this is this is real this is this is like it <laughs> but um Wow. Yeah, it's, I guess, I mean, I, I had heard that, though, in my prep, because once I got through the, the, the audition with, like, the in-person, quote-unquote, with the Zoom, I kind of had a feeling they liked my stories, they liked my personality, I played well. I had a feeling that I might be getting called at some point. And so I started reading all previous people that had been on the show and what they recommend and deep diving on blogs. And one person, I forget who wrote it, but they said, you know, you can't study for Jeopardy once they tell you you're going to be on Jeopardy. You have to you don't get ready, you stay ready. And that's why watching the show all the time and just generally being knowledgeable, right? Reading a lot, just, which is my daily routine. I read a lot. You know, I don't spend much time on social media or video games or stuff like that. So I, I read, that's my thing. But at the same time, yeah, when they tell you it's, it's go time, those three weeks become a huge cram session. And luckily for me, uh, I freelance. That's kind of all I do for my different jobs. So I was able to work around my fluid schedule. I didn't have to be at a nine to five job or you know commute anywhere. So I had a lot of time to prepare and study and commit to this. And I went into the show feeling smarter than I ever had in terms of trivia and recall. There was things that I'd never knew in my life that I could now recite, you know, whether it was the English monarchy or famous museums or African capitals or you know historic wars, all this stuff that I'd forgotten since learning about it in high school or, or college. Uh, came back to me really quickly. Uh, but then it ends up being a buzzer game, as you know, uh, once you get there, more than half the battle is how quickly can you uh, get on the signaling device. But yeah, three weeks, it's not a lot, uh, but they, they want people, I guess, uh, as sharp as possible all the time and not have too much time to, to study because then otherwise it becomes maybe just who, who can study the best as opposed to who's best you know, in the moment. Yeah, I think what you just said uh, reminded me of what Jaskarin, the winner of the National College Championship, said when he was on the show. When I asked him the same question about what he did to study, um, he said that, you know, you're pretty much where you're at. And 
like a small percentage of what you do leading up to the show well between the time you get the call and taping for the show is like very very uh, i guess no pun intended trivial um <laughs> but uh yeah there's only so much you can do in, in that short amount of time to prepare for the show and i think um yeah you're just pretty much where you're at and you're where you're at in terms of knowledge yeah, I think you could definitely. I think you definitely brush up on some areas that you identify as weaknesses. But yeah, like like stuff that I felt confident in: geography, American history, pop culture, sports. I didn't study that at all, right? Because I you have to be confident that you you're not going to be able to study everything. But mm -hmm. certain things I knew would be recurring: Shakespeare, opera, classical music. Just going through some of the stuff that you know has been on Jeopardy before. It can't hurt. But now, like I tell you, now, since the show, all that stuff is deleted from my brain because I just don't mm. have the bandwidth to keep it. I kind of crammed for knowing that. And, and that day, I, I knew that stuff. Over time now, I don't need to know the plot of Love's Labor Lost or whatever anymore in my daily life. I, and I thought about it for that day. But yeah, you basically kind of go in with what you know in general and then just try my advice for anybody going in is identify the five or six categories that historically appear on the show that maybe you feel you, you don't have strength in. And just try and know a couple things just to hold your own in case it shows up. And some things did show up in my episode that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't crammed those three weeks. Uh, I just didn't have the chance to, to answer them quickly enough uh, was the problem. But you can help. But yeah, to, to that point, you're only going to be able to help yourself maybe you know, increase your knowledge percent by maybe 4 or 5% max. You're not going to learn everything you need to know in that short amount of time you have to prep. This is actually a perfect transition because in past episodes... At this point of the podcast, this is, usually my seg this is usually my segue into talking about what people did to prepare for the show. But before we do that, Mike, I'd like to talk about your background in career media because I feel like a lot of what I found while doing my research will play into how you approach studying for Jeopardy. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. That's, that's a good podcast you're doing research beforehand. <laughs> so I, I applaud the effort from one media host to, to Thank another. Thank you. Great. So as a sportscaster who's covered you know, college football, college basketball, and Major League Baseball, I think it's fair to assume that sports is your biggest strength, or am I missing something and you're actually well-versed in, I don't know, science-related topics? Uh, no, sports would be number one, anything pop culture. So whenever there's a Jeopardy category, you know, 90s R&B, Oscar winners, uh, I got a, a baseball stadiums category in my episode. Uh, that's always my jam. So yeah, I, I know... I know a lot for a sports person, but that would still be uh, my strength, I guess you could say. In the last two episodes of this podcast, when talking about things to study for on Jeopardy, at least two people have said that sports was a lost cause for them, and they didn't bother <laughs> with it, especially with how infrequently sports categories appear on the show. Two questions for you, Mike. First, did you have a specific area of knowledge that you didn't bother with, or perhaps a specific category that you prayed wouldn't appear in your game? Uh, yeah... Not that I didn't bother with it, but, you know, art, I just did a cursory thing. You know, I found maybe the 10 most frequent uh, artists or, or paintings that appear as Jeopardy clues over the years. And I just drilled my, those into my head. Um, you know, Vermeer is the girl with the pearl earring. Mm. Uh, Picasso, Starry Night, like things like that, that just the, the most basic cursory level that, hey, if I can get a $200 and $400 clue out of an art category, I'll be happy with myself. Uh, so I didn't do much deeper than that. And then I ended up getting an art category on my show that went to some really deep uh, artworks that I'd never even heard of, even in my studying. So probably that was my one category that I dreaded, and I ended up getting it head on, which was the price I paid, I suppose, for having a baseball stadiums category that was right <laughs> up my alley. Uh, the deal you make with the devil, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I probably artwork, because uh, everything else I, I felt pretty strong on, at least on my studying. But that... Uh, I'd say classical music and maybe opera were my three my three headed monster of, of things that I was hoping were not there, but I did study still for them. I, I didn't lost cause anything. I always wanted to at least have, at least a little bit of knowledge uh, in as many categories as I could, just to feel as prepared as possible. Uh, because we're on a trivia podcast, I do have to correct you about Starry Night. Van Gogh was the one who painted that one, not Picasso. <laughs> oh, right. See, there you go. I, I've, been, I've, been three, I've been three months out of recording my episodes. Like I told you, all that information is out of my brain. And that's, proof, exactly. that's proof right there. Uh, and second, uh, you kind of talked about it throughout this episode already, but what was your reaction when you saw Ballpark as a category in your Jeopardy round? My honest first reaction was I wasn't sure what it was about because um, sometimes it, with Jeopardy, with Jeopardy clues, and I, it's more with other game shows. Jeopardy is a bit more straightforward, but 
ballpark could be, it could have been all sports. It could have been uh, games you play as a kid, not professional sports. So I didn't know exactly what it was, but I had a feeling, okay, this will be at least something in my, in my ballpark, pun intended. Um, or, or, or it could have been that, right? Like, uh, they, they get clever sometimes where it, the category could be ballpark, for example, but it's about planets and like, oh, this planet is within the ballpark of this moon and they just completely change it on you, right? So I wasn't 100% pumped that it was something I would know until I went for the first clue and then I knew, okay, this is going to be uh, pro sports. And I actually got the first one. I didn't get it right because I, I was confused and I was between two possible responses and I decided it wasn't worth it to risk it on a 50-50 shot. But then from then on, I knew, okay, this is going to be it for me. So I was pumped that I would at least you know, have some respectable showing and get a few questions right. Then I was also partly abjectly terrified that what if my two competitors also know baseball stadiums as well as I do and they're faster on the buzzer than me and now the one category that I'm expected to dominate I end up getting shut out in. I didn't want that to happen either. So all in the span of 15 seconds, you go through a lot of emotions, but I guess that's what Jeopardy uh, does to you and by design. Yeah, speaking of uh, a lot of emotions, I had a, a moment like that in my episode where uh, the final clue in Double Jeopardy of my episode, uh, it was under Island Folk, and it was for 400, and the clue was uh, a Pinoy is a person of this ethnic heritage, and, you know, me being Filipino, mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd expect me to, like, answer that, and I did, and then as soon as I, I hesitated for a bit at first, and then I said, what's Filipino, and I was real correct, and then I keeled over and breathed a huge sigh of relief, which got a <laughs> lot of laughs and a lot of reactions from Filipinos on social media. And, uh, you know, if I if I wasn't going to win, I was at least going to have my moment, you know. And I'm glad um, Raymond, he gave me a run for my money by going for it, whereas my other competitor, Lucy, she let me have that clue. And, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have had it any other way. And it was <laughs> it was a really fun moment to look back on. Yeah, you want you want those at least. If, if you're not going to win your episode, you at least want a Jeopardy moment. And I'm happy you got yours. I'm glad I got mine. A lot of people don't. So you got to hopefully just try and get that uh, that moment in the sun when it comes to you. Yeah, and on another note, I feel like this episode will probably hold the record for most terrible puns and most cheesy <laughs> metaphors and analogies at this rate. <laughs> oh, my Lord. All right, next, going back to your time as an adjudicator for Guinness World Records, you had the opportunity to interview a ton of celebrities, including Vanna White, LeBron James, Kelly Ripa, and as mentioned previously, Alex Trebek. You also got to travel a lot, and I have written here in my notes that you've been to 41 countries and 49 states. Now, that probably wasn't all just because of Guinness, but regardless, that's quite impressive. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you, so I'll start by asking some easy ones. What's sure, the one I, state... I, I, as, sorry, as, as a journalist myself, my website's out of date, so I have to uh, uh. <laughs> update that. But uh, I, I have since completed my, my U.S. bingo, so I've gone to all 50 states now, and I believe I'm up to 45 countries, so... Just to keep the record straight uh, and make sure that your your up your information is as updated as possible. But yeah, go ahead. What was that? What was that one state? Because that was actually going to be my first question. What's the one state you ah. had to visit? Uh, it was Hawaii. So oh, that wow. was my last one. Yeah, and I mean it's the it's the hardest to get to, uh, debatably, and it's the coolest, debatably, or the most fun. So I was saving that once I got to like the late the high 30s, early 40s. Uh, of country of states i told myself unless i have to go to hawaii for something i'm going to save that for last as kind of the the cherry on top uh no offense to any other states especially the main 48 but you know going to hawaii to celebrate you know doing all 50 also was the last state into the union just felt most most appropriate what was there to do in alaska and wyoming because i feel like those are like the two isolated states because <laughs> who would well, want alaska, to go to Wyoming. All right. Well, <laughs> if you like country, that's the spot for you. And if you like peace and quiet, for sure. Uh, I mean, Alaska, I actually lived there for a summer. Oh, so wow. in college, yeah, in college, I had an internship between my sophomore and junior years. And there's the uh, Alaska Baseball League out there, which is a summer collegiate baseball league. So some of the best college baseball prospects in their sophomore, junior years go up there and play for the summer. And they live there and it's like a six team league. And some of the, some Mark McGuire played there, Tom Seaver, Barry Bonds, like some legit names have come through that league. And so I went up there to be the radio guy for one of the teams up there as part of my summer internship. So I was there for two months from uh, early or mid-May to uh, early July. And yeah, it was great. So I got to live with the host family, got to travel all around the state, had time to go explore and 
you know, hike glaciers and go fishing and look for whales and, uh, you know, see moose in the parking lot of your hotel, uh, the whole Alaska experience. So uh, that's what I did there. It was incredible. I can't believe it's been uh, almost 20 years since that, since that summer. And then uh, Wyoming was part of a road trip I took where I, you know, I rented a car in Minnesota, went down to Arizona and back, and I tried to spend a little bit of time uh, in each state along the way. And Wyoming, yeah, I just uh, you know, went there, got lunch at a local off-the-beaten-path restaurant, got to walk around a couple small towns, uh, just driving through some back roads. And then I think I went through there again when I went to uh, Yellowstone National Park, uh, so yeah, national parks and, and outdoor spaces, that's what, the, that's what there is to do uh, in Wyoming. But Alaska is great if you have a chance to go. There's so much stuff, especially if you love outdoor stuff. There's kayaking, there's you know, ice climbing, there's uh, a, a city called North Pole that's decorated like Christmas all year long with a live-in Santa Claus if you want to go. It's great. And 24 hours of sunlight if you go in the summer. Um, so Alaska, shout out. I had a great time there and uh, would love to go back someday. Do you keep little mementos from your visits to each state, like fridge magnets? I know I collect snow globes from every like major city that I go to. Do you have anything like uh, that? That's cool. Uh, I don't just because once I started, uh, I did when I was younger, but then once especially I got to working for, for Guinness World Records and the travel really picked up, I just knew if I was doing snow globes, for example, I'd have an entire room full of them, right? So <laughs> Or fridge magnets, same thing. So especially as iPhones started getting popular and I could just take pictures that would mm. be with me forever. I figured those would be my memories. Uh, I used to, when I went to a different country, always get a flag of that country and collect those, which is why, you know, national flags I was hoping was a Jeopardy category of mine too, but that didn't happen. Uh, but even that started getting to a point where as I started moving apartments or homes, you know, what do I do with all this stuff? And I don't own a five bedroom house where I can have a study that just has all my my different knickknacks and things. So yeah, the short answer to that is no. But if I do see something cool or I experience something cool, you know, I went to one of my Michigan trips. I was there for Guinness World Records, judging a record at uh, the Michigan football stadium. They played a hockey game there and there was a commemorative puck uh, for that game. So that I keep, cause it's like a cool, unique thing. Mm. But just to, you know, if I'm driving through Arkansas, I'm not gonna stop and get an you know, Arkansas for lovers t-shirt or whatever, just to say, just to say that I got something. What's your favorite country you've traveled to? Uh, this is probably a, not a fair way to answer it, but I'm, I am Portuguese. Uh, I'm a dual citizen. All my family's from there. All my grandparents immigrated from there. So anytime I get to go back there, it's my favorite because it's kind of a home away from home. But beyond that, I don't know, man, there's been, there's been so many. Yeah, I can't pick one. That's, that's going to be uh, it's like a parent picking their favorite child. I'm a big history person, so anything historic I love to go to. Uh, England seems like a very easy answer, but there's so much history there. I loved going to Italy, Turin, Rome, just so much. That, Israel, all the stuff that happened there, you know, biblically and historically. So, uh, yeah, anywhere that has a lot of history. Uh, I know Russia is not really nice in the news now <laughs> for obvious good reasons, but... When I got to go there a few years ago, politically aside, just the history that's there that you don't really get exposed to uh, in, in Western teachings a lot, just learning about that, for example. Uh, Japan, same thing. So I know you asked for one and I've given you at least like five or six at this point, but <laughs> every country has something cool. I, I've just loved a little bit something different. I haven't gotten anywhere yet that I didn't like. I'll put it that way. Is there any country that you haven't visited yet but would like to? That list is going to be even longer. Um, I mean, China... <laughs> Australia, Egypt, those are probably uh, Greece. Those are like my top four. Uh, again, historically, China, just everything that's happened there for, for millennia. Greece, Egypt, same thing. Australia, just because I, I want to eventually, I finished 50 states, I want to do all seven continents. Uh, so Antarctica will be up there at some point too, maybe for my 40th birthday, some big milestone birthday or something like that. But in terms of traditional countries, uh, yeah, in some order, China, Egypt, Greece, Australia, those are my, my big four for, for what's hopefully coming up next. I went to Greece last summer, and let me tell you, it was hot when we went. Oh, my Ah, I can Lord. imagine. Yeah. Yeah, being up there at the Parthenon, at like the, like the top, it was just, oh, my Lord. I've never felt such heat before. And I, I sweat a lot, and I don't tan easily. So that's good advice because I'll be making sure to get my SPF and some, uh, some sweat-wicking uh, shirts if I, if I end up making it there. Yeah, and two countries that I've... I've wanted to go to for a while now are Japan and the Philippines. Summer 2020, my parents and family were thinking of like going there because I'm Filipino, but I've never been to the Philippines. So that's obviously a must do in my mm. lifetime. So I've wanted to like 
go there and experience it for myself. Uh, and Tokyo, just because I love uh, Japan, Japanese culture. I mean, I've watched a couple of YouTube videos of like Japanese vloggers and YouTubers, and I just like love to explore Tokyo. What part of Japan did you go to while you were there? Uh, it was Tokyo. I was there for work, so we got to be there uh, three or four days. So I'm sure I could go back there and really deep dive even more. Uh, but even those couple days, I just, you know, I fell in love with the place. It was great. So I hope you get to go there sometime. And the Philippines, too, because I, I mentioned Portugal before. To be able to go to wherever you have roots, right? It's just there's something mm, yeah. elemental about that and something you can appreciate uh, you know, just, just the history of, of yourself uh, from mm -hmm. where you come from. So, yeah, man, I hope you get to go there sometime. That, that's, uh, that's really awesome for you someday. And by virtue of me bringing this all up, it leads me to ask, how much did traveling the world help you when it came to studying for Jeopardy? Did your geography skills improve at all? And do you think traveling helped attune you to the different cultures you experienced? 100%. Uh, with the geography, I think it helps a lot just because a lot of people – you don't know, oh, that country's located where, but if you travel there, or if you travel to, uh, like last summer, I probably couldn't pick, to be honest, and to sound a little bit ignorant, I couldn't pick Estonia uh, on a map if you asked me to, but I went to Finland last year for the summer, and they have a cruise ship that goes to Estonia like daily, and it's like a 45 minute ride, and we took a day trip there. So now if there was you know, a Baltic Sea category or something, I would know the country's a lot better uh, around there if, if that was the case. So little things like that, that definitely help. And then culturally too, because when you go to different places, and if you do travel right, and you actually get to appreciate uh, the local cultures and traditions, and you're not just going to all the tourist traps, I think it definitely helps uh, open your, your eyes a little bit. And that's something that I've always prided myself on, is that I love learning. And I think a lot of people think of learning as just what you do in a classroom or on a, on a seminar online or something. But uh, learning is reading books. It's going to new places. It's meeting new people, people from backgrounds different than yourself, people from different uh, that have different work lives than you there's you know you can learn every day and i think travel is a huge part of that i think you put it best and you it was unrelated but you did mention little things and that moves me on to my next <laughs> my next part of like your resume review i suppose uh, in 2017 you worked a hosting gig for little a company called little things which is if i had to describe it a family lifestyle media company targeted for women is that accurate yeah that's pretty much spot on so you did that for a year, and in 2018, you were a show host for Reward the Fan, a mobile app trivia game show, which is actually where I know you from. I remember mm -hmm. playing that game a lot when HQ Trivia pioneered the idea of a startup company giving away absurd amounts of money on a daily basis. <laughs> One of my favorite moments from those days was when I was in my freshman dorm room playing Reward the Fan, and after answering all of the questions correctly, I won the lottery at the end of the show and two tickets to that year's iHeartRadio Jingle Ball concert at Madison Square nice. Garden. I took a friend with me and we had an amazing time. Anyway, getting us back on track, it seems to me that these two jobs placed a heavy emphasis on pop culture. And as a host and scriptwriter, I'd imagine some of that stuff you researched settled into your brain like osmosis. My question for you, Mike, is do you think your time at Little Things or Reward the Fan helped you keep in touch with pop culture? Uh, no more than I already would have been. I think it was kind of the opposite, that me staying in touch with pop culture and kind of knowing that uh, is what made me good at those jobs. Um, there were some things that I would learn uh, here and there, but I think it was, it was kind of the reverse, if we're being honest, where I was doing all that anyway, because I just love that kind of stuff as on a personal level. And so being able to keep up with that, I think made me better at the job than the job made me better at, at that, if, if that makes sense. Mm, well said. Yeah, I know that was all two to four years ago for you. So I'm curious as to what you did to, I guess, keep up with the trends in preparation for Jeopardy because they really like to include pop culture. One clue from your episode that comes to mind is palindromic words for 600, where the answer was, what is sus in reference to the game Among Us? I know that clip of that clue went viral on Twitter shortly after yeah. your episode aired. <laughs> it did. And I think that's something that you know I give Jeopardy credit for, especially in the new Michael Davies era, is trying to be more modern and not just being about you know who knows the most... Uh, I don't know, uh, Beethoven sonatas or whatever. But, um, you know, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot. So I think just, just being online helps me keep up with that. Like, I've never played Among Us, but I knew of that game. I knew of the terminology. That's another one where, you know, I got buzzed in by one of my competitors before I could get to it. So, yeah, I, I don't think I, I necessarily 
did anything special to keep up with it. You know, I'm going to watch the Oscars anyway. I'm going to watch the Grammys anyway. I'm going to go to the movies every weekend anyway. That's just what I do. Um, I keep up with all the latest trendy and buzzy TV shows and, and prestige dramas and stuff like that. So uh, I think just by virtue of, be, of living my life and consuming content the way I do, uh, I kind of just have that ingrained in me anyway. I didn't feel like I had to do anything extra or special uh, to really drum up on that. Just just be me, which was the easiest preparation to do. What about dogs? I know that's hyper specific for Jeopardy, but the hosting <laughs> for the American Kennel Club, add to your knowledge of dog breeds or other animal related trivia? Uh, that it has, especially because I'm still working at that job. So I have to be very current with it and on it. Uh, and there was actually, I forget if it was the episode right before mine or the one before that, but Matea, who was the champ on my episode, uh, had a dog category that she did pretty convincingly well on in that as well. And I was sitting in the audience thinking, oh, that, that was my nightmare scenario, that a category like that coming up and then someone else doing better at it than me when everyone watching expects me to do well at it. So I was kind of glad I dodged that bullet uh, with her because she was just uh, on fire that day. But yeah, so in that regard, uh, I was kind of hoping, all right, I'd have something like that to come up my alley right in my wheelhouse. Uh, it ended up the timing not being great, but uh, yeah, if, if I were to, to do some dog stuff, I think I'd be better prepared for that now than most than the average person would be. So the last media appearance I want to discuss with you is your big win a few years ago on $100,000 Pyramid. First yeah. off, congrats. That alone is huge, for lack of a better term. Second, thank you, thank you. I personally have never watched Pyramid before, so when I watched a few clips of the show, not including yours, unfortunately, I couldn't find it on YouTube, I thought to myself, wow, that's got to be extremely nerve-wracking, especially with so much money on the line. Did you find taping for Jeopardy to be more relaxed than taping for Pyramid, or were there some aspects of taping for Jeopardy that perhaps gave you some unnerving flashbacks? To be honest, it, it helped me a lot that I do this for a living, being in front of a camera, mm. you know, being in TV studios. Uh, when I work Mets games, I'm in front of a crowd of 44,000 people some nights uh, live. And so the whole aspect of being in a TV studio, I saw this more on Pyramid, I think, than with Jeopardy, because Pyramid was pre-COVID, it was a full studio audience, uh, no restrictions. So a lot of people that day, other contestants, did get a little bit nervous and they said as much, whereas I was thriving in it and anticipating it. Uh, Jeopardy now with the COVID protocols, the only audience were the people that were working that day and the other contestants. So it felt more like you were just kind of hanging out in front of friends and family. So I think the nerves aspect wasn't as high there for some people. Uh, but for me, it was actually more, there was actually more anxiety filming Jeopardy just because of the personal meaning of the show to me. I wanted to do so well on Jeopardy because it's been such a totemic part of my life uh, for almost all of my life. Uh, whereas Pyramid, yeah, the money was great. And I, I think I got a little bit, if you're not getting nervous, then I think that's not necessarily a good thing. Nerves can be good. And so I always think of, of you know, a little bit of, of nerves is okay. It just means that you're, that you're locked in and that your, your senses are heightened and aware for whatever the situation is. But yeah, for the most part, I saw Pyramid as, wow, this is fun and I can't wait to come in here and just destroy this game and my competition and then win a lot of money. Whereas Jeopardy, I wanted it to be sort of a validation of my life's preparation. And that is what made it a bit more nerve wracking for me. And it's a whole different game because Pyramid is more about wordplay, connecting with your playing partner um, and, and speed, mental speed. Whereas Jeopardy is more about, you know, buzzer speed and preparation ahead of time. You can't really prepare for Pyramid the way you prepare for Jeopardy in a studying sense. And so I felt more comfortable going into Pyramid because my brain and my communication style, I think works better there. And you control your own destiny more on that show mm -hmm. than you do on Jeopardy, where you're playing against two other people and their buzzer uh, you know, signaling capability. Whereas Pyramid, as long as you take care of your business, you're most likely gonna succeed. And so, yeah, two very different preparations and two very different gameplay uh, strategies and techniques. But I think for me, yeah, the money was, was, was nerve wracking for sure, but I felt way more confident there in Pyramid, almost because with Jeopardy, I wanted to live up to my own expectations. Mm. And that always just adds an extra burden to whatever it is you're doing. But I had a, I had a blast, I had a blast on both. Um, you know, it was great. And thankfully Pyramid, I was able to win a lot of money then. So losing on Jeopardy, like I would have I would have been fine winning a Jeopardy episode with a dollar. Like I wasn't there for the, for the money. Uh, I was there for being able to say I won on Jeopardy. 
So it helped soften the blow a little bit, knowing that I had a game show moment of glory years and years ago. Uh, and so being able to at least appear on Jeopardy and make it to final, that was one thing I didn't want to end up in the red, uh, ended up being you know, a good life, life goal checked for me. So with your career in the rearview mirror, let's talk about the time between when you got the call to be on the show and your taping day again. Uh, what resources did you use to prepare for Jeopardy and maximize your chances of winning? I think you mentioned a few that I use myself in a thread of afterthoughts on Twitter. Yeah, for me, and I took this from James Holzhauer. I don't know if that's where you got it from, but uh, children's books. Uh, I went to, well, first I identified kind of between five and ten categories of Jeopardy that I felt weak on. Some of the aforementioned stuff we talked about, opera, classical music, etc., and I went to my local Queens Public Library in Astoria and just checked out, I think, literally 33 children's books or something like that on all these different topics. And I just buzzed through those. And I made flashcards based on uh, information that was new to me. So if I came across something that I was familiar with, Shakespeare, I know the plot of Romeo and Juliet, right? But I maybe forgot the name of the guy who set them up, Friar Lawrence. So that I would put on a flashcard. And I would just have these flashcards for information that I knew I didn't know. And I would spend the morning for those three straight weeks consuming information, creating the flashcards, and then spending the afternoons and evenings reviewing the flashcards, taking an hour, hour and a half at a time, just going through them by myself with my girlfriend, forward, backward, all that kind of stuff. And for that first week after I got the call, it was all information intake. And then for the second and third week was just information drilling in. So I wasn't learning new things because I figured there's only so much you can cram in. Now it's just a matter of retention. And I spent that second and third week just retaining, uh, retaining, retaining. Uh, I bought the Secrets of the Buzzer book to try and learn what tips to be faster on the signaling device. Uh, I rented uh, Claire McNear's book, uh, her great like, mm. history on Jeopardy, great book. just to learn from other people that had been on the show and, and what strategies they had. I'd gone through different blogs and read whatever books I could on people's contestant experience. And I actually knew a couple of people professionally that had been on the show in the past. So reaching out to some of them via DMs on social media, hey, what can I expect? What advice do you have? Stuff like that. And, uh, and then watching the show, you know, I'd watch it every night. And that was during Amy Schneider's run. So I got to see a master at work and trying to learn from, from her and how she approached the game. And yeah, that was, that was pretty much my prep. Was there a category that you felt very prepared for but didn't appear in your game? I was hoping for a museum's category. And I got one question when they were, it was a category about they would name look landmarks and you had to name the city they were in. And the one that I got was Madrid, and the, the clue was the Prado and uh, the Bernabeu Stadium where Real Madrid plays. So I knew that already anyway, but um, Jeopardy tends to have a lot of recurring museums, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And I, I kind of feel like I had cracked the code on knowing maybe the top 10 most popular museums that recur in gameplay. So I was really hoping for a museums uh, category. Plus I live in New York City, so I, you know, I know a lot of them here. I've been to a bunch across the country. So I was hoping for something like that. Um, and it just didn't, didn't end up happening for me. But maybe a museum's one uh, would have been probably, probably it for me. So in a previous episode, Kira Donegan, when she was on the show, or no, it wasn't Kira. It was actually her sister, uh, Kristen Donegan, mentioned that in her preparation process, she also made flashcards and ended up making about 4,000. Do you know if Oof. your amount of flashcards was either more or less than that? Way, way less. And I'd read uh, someone, too. I think it was Matt Jackson, who was a great champ back in the day. He had like 20,000 flashcards wow, or something. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I just wouldn't know. My, I would get carpal tunnel from writing out all the <laughs> flashcards by hand. I guess you could print them, too. But I think part of, of what helps me retain information is writing it down. But aside the point, no, I had maybe, it was in the low 200s, so maybe that's why I didn't do as well. But I, I, no, I, I take that back, because I felt very prepared. And I went back and I did the research, because somebody asked me this, and there were 22 more answers that I knew on the show that I just got beat to the, the signaling device by my two competitors. So with the questions I got right, plus the ones that I knew, but I just couldn't buzz in on time, I felt that was as prepared as I was going to be in terms of the, knowing the stuff. So, yeah, if I had 4,000 or even 500 flashcards, I just wouldn't have been able, my brain wouldn't have been able to keep all that information in. It would have all started getting lost. Plus the timing, even with just the 200, I think it was 220 something that I had, just going through those would take me 60 to 90 minutes. And so wow. I can only imagine if I had 4,000 of those, 
I would be literally spending 20 hours of my day just going through flashcards. And you know, I have a girlfriend. She would want to see me once in a while, I would think, in that preparation time. And I had my other jobs and stuff. So good for people that can get all that going and that can retain all that information. But that's just not how my brain works. But maybe that's why I was a one and done contestant and some of these other people go on to win uh, nine, <laughs> 10 shows in a row. Going back to the Donegan Sisters episode, when Kira was interviewed, she talked about how on her taping day, the only time she got to speak with the other contestants was when they were eating lunch in the Sony Pictures parking garage. Was it the same experience for you, Mike, or were you able to get to know some of your competition on a personal level? No, we got to chat a little bit. Uh, we all got there early and before they brought us in, we were all hanging out in the same area. And then it was really just who wants to talk, right? Because some people are, they go into their Kobe Bryant mode and just go into the corner and they just get you know, amped up and they don't want to talk to anybody and they're trying to get into their zone. Other people were more friendly. Some people were there the day before already. Um, I think my two uh, competitors, they didn't play the previous day, but they were already there, just you know, tape schedule wise. And so they had already built a bit of a rapport. But yeah, then in, in the green room while we're waiting, before they give us the orientation, we're all kind of sitting there and it's just, it's like any awkward gathering with 20 strangers in a room for the first time. Some people are extroverts, some aren't, some start conversations, some love small talk, some don't. So I got to know a couple of people and other folks got to strike up. It seemed like really good friendships really quickly. And then during the tapings between episodes, we'd be in the studio audience chatting with each other at lunch, obviously uh, able to talk as well. So. Uh, yeah, there were definitely times throughout the day, but you could tell some people wanted nothing to do with anyone else until after they taped their, their show or shows because they just wanted to not have any other distractions. Some people wanted to make new friends very quickly. It's just the spectrum of the human experience, and Jeopardy is a, a good Petri dish for that as, as much as anything else. Do you and your contestant cohort have a group chat of some sort or keep in contact at all? I know Kira mentioned that it wasn't until her group's episodes aired that they managed to reconnect with and root for each other on social media. Uh, we, we don't, uh, to be honest. Uh, Matea, who was the, the winner of my episode, the champ when, uh, on, on my week, on my run there, uh, she, we follow each other and uh, we reached out via DMs on Twitter. I think she had just joined Twitter just for this. I don't think she had an account before. Uh, as a 23 year old, that makes sense. Twitter is more, uh, from what I gather, for old guys in their 30s, older 30s like me. But um, so I reached out to her and, and wished her luck and she had some nice words for me. But a lot of the other folks that were there, either I, I haven't uh, reached out to them or they haven't found me. Uh, a lot of people too, they like to keep private and I respect that. A lot of folks that don't have their public names as their social media names. I'm very different in the fact that I want as many people to know me on social media as possible because that's part of my career, being a content creator and an on-air an on personality. But a lot of people don't want that. So I think Facebook is good for that, but I'm not on Facebook. So that ends up just being a lot of weird circumstances that prevent us from maybe being as, as close of a group as maybe some other tape days are. But nothing against anybody personally. A lot of cool people I met that day uh, that I really clicked with that, there in that moment. But I guess for whatever reason, we just haven't, uh, haven't reconnected since. Yeah, the main um, difference between being on the syndicated show versus being in a tournament, uh, we talked about this when the Donegan sisters were on. Kristen was on the Jeopardy! National College Championship, whereas Kira was on the syndicated show. Kristen, by virtue of being in the tournament, we were able to you know, bond together, sharing the commonality of you know, being undergrads and being able to talk about our majors, what we're up to, where we're from and whatnot. Whereas being on the syndicated show, it's pretty much just the people who get called in to be on the show that day. And it, I think it's kind of hard considering there's no like one commonality other than you taping for Jeopardy that day. And so I think uh, the lack of one shared aspect uh, kind of hinders you a bit from meshing with your group unless you have like, you know, the same age range, the same. Right, know, exactly. Education. Like for example, my, my particular episode, it's uh, Matea who ends up winning. She's a 23 year old from Nova Scotia, lives in Toronto. She's a tutor doesn't know sports at all. On the other side was Reagan, who was a big sports fan, but uh, she's 19. She's still going to school oh, wow. in college. Uh, yeah, exactly. She was, a, she was a wonder kid, man. She was, uh, she was incredible. And you know, me as a 36-year-old that lives in New York, you know, I, have a, I live with my girlfriend. I, I work in freelance. Like, 
there's just a lot, you know, we're three different people at very different parts of our lives with very different interests. And uh, yeah, like you're right. It, what you guys have in a tournament is all something in common that can, that can bond you. Um, so I think that's a great point that you're going to find more camaraderie, I think, in that environment just because it's, it's natural, right? You guys have all that in common versus the syndicated where, like you said, you could be playing against someone that is a completely different age than you, lives in a completely different part of the country, has a completely different career. Uh, and the only thing you have in common is Johnny Gilbert says your name on the same day. And that's the end of that. <laughs> on the topic of competition, assuming you observed every game that aired last week from the audience, did you ever feel intimidated by the way Matea was playing? And did watching Matea change your gameplay strategy at all once it was your turn to step up to the podium? Changing my strategy, no, because I, I knew going in that I was going to be as aggressive as I could be early. And I ended up doing that, going all in on my daily double uh, early in, in Jeopardy. And uh, it cost me, but I wouldn't have done anything differently. And then at that point, I was just kind of behind the eight ball with two great players next to me that were so fast in the buzzer and so knowledgeable with their, with their expertise that at that point, once I got, once we went through like a category in double jeopardy, I kind of knew, all right, I'm just here along for the ride. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a spectator here. Just enjoy the experience. But having seen Mateo win the two games before uh, the one I played her, I was just hoping that I got some lucky categories that broke my way that would, because I, I knew she was a, a better player than me. So that certainly, I guess, was a little bit intimidating. I still went in very confident because I knew, all right, if, if the categories break my way, I think I, I can still do very well, uh, if not win outright. But having seen uh, you know, the, first, the first two games where it was two different champs, I thought, oh, are we in for a week where it's just going to be a different champ every day? Uh, Matea very much put a stop to that very quickly. Um, but no, I wouldn't say it changed my strategy much at all, uh, especially because anytime you have a champ that's won fewer than five games, you wonder if they just had a couple lucky days. We're seeing with Matea that that's not the case. She's just a legitimately dominant and great player. Whereas if you came into a Matt Amodio or an Amy Schneider and they've won... 35 straight, maybe that would have changed my strategy drastically because you have to do something against someone that's just that dominant. But when it's someone at the beginning of their run, you kind of have to go in playing the game you wanted to play because once, it's like in sports, once the other team dictates the pace and changes your strategy, they've kind of already won. So I went in going into it thinking I'm going to do what I plan to do. It just ended up not working out that way for me. Yeah, I think what fans have to realize is that there's a lot of factors as a Jeopardy contestant that you can't control. The categories, who you go up against. When you're playing at home, I mean, it's easy to shout the answers out to your television and, like, ask yourself, oh, why didn't they know that? Why are they on the show, you know? But, like, like you alluded to earlier, it could just be a difference between who's faster on the buzzer. I mean, we'll get into this later, but your box scores, I mean, all of you attempted the same, pretty much all attempted the same amount of uh, clues. So, and you wouldn't know that unless the box scores were without. So I think that's something for fans to keep in mind. I think just getting on the show is an accomplishment in and of itself. You know, only about 400 to 500 people get on per season. And yeah, I, I think that's just an incredible feat to think about um, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and that's part of what uh, and my girlfriend's great at this. And she was kind of my life coach through this. And she was saying, hey, uh, you know, no matter what happens, just try and enjoy the moment for what it is. And I had read in Claire McNear's book, uh, a story about a guy who kept studying his flashcards the day of his taping, like in the studio audience while the other shows were going, being taped. And, and I didn't want to be that person. I wanted to be there drinking it all in. You know, I went there the first time to present Alex that certificate, and I feel like I was so overwhelmed by it all that I didn't have a chance to really uh, drink in the atmosphere. This time I didn't want that to happen. So win, lose, or, or I guess there is no draw on Jeopardy anymore. Uh, but win or lose, uh, I wanted to enjoy the experience and have something to talk about uh, you know, for forever after. So uh, I, I told myself that, that getting there was uh, un an impressive thing in and of itself. Because like you said, after that, I won't, so much is out of your hands and uh, so much was. But being there was not out of my hands and getting to enjoy that experience was not either. And I'm glad that I had that opportunity. So if you're ever following Jeopardy on social media, you'll know that there are a lot of people out there who would much rather have Ken Jennings be the permanent host of the show rather than actress Maya Bialik. Some are more, let's just say, outspoken than others. But Mike, as a host yourself and having experienced an episode of Jeopardy hosted by Maya, I'm curious to know your opinion on her as a host. Has she been improving recently? Do you think Ken is better suited for the role? Would you have preferred Ken to host your episode? What are your thoughts? 
Uh, I had no preference really. They're both, I think they're both great. They're very different in the role. In terms of just, I guess, for gameplay sake moving forward, uh, I think most players would prefer one host, whoever it is, to just be the consistent syndicated version host. Because a lot of people do base their buzzing strategy off the cadence and the voice of the host. Uh, it's a great thing about Alex was that he was, in a good way, very metronomic in that you could kind of time the cadence of a Jeopardy episode by his delivery. Whereas, you know, I'm very curious, it didn't matter for, for Matt Amodio or for Amy Schneider, uh, where they had different hosts. Matt even had, what, like five or six different hosts with all yeah. the guest hosts that he went through. And for some players, that doesn't matter. But, you know, I'll be curious to see the players who have, moving forward, uh, championship reigns that span both hosts and if they uh, struggle with adapting. So I think, uh, you know, having one host, even if it's a different host for the, for the primetime specials and one for the syndicated version, I just think players may appreciate that moving forward. But... Uh, it depends on how you like your bread buttered. Ken is very much the Jeopardy icon and a, as a bit of an institution as well, just because of his history with the show. And I think from having spent so much time with Alex, uh, he knows the cadence of the show traditionally very well. But then Mayim brings this sort of charismatic enthusiasm that maybe is a little bit absent from even the Alex shows of the past. And a lot of people like that as well. So like anything these days, there's a, a huge polarity to it. And I think it just depends on personal preference. But I, I do uh, respect and appreciate the sentiment of people that would like you know, one host to handle the one line of the show just for consistency's sake. But I could see pros, uh, pros for both. So other than during your contestant interview, were you able to chat with Mayim at all? Maybe once the game was over during the Overheard segment? Uh, a little bit, yeah. And because she, I believe she was born in New York City and she may have lived here a few years uh, growing up. And she's a big Yankees fan. So knowing that I was a Mets fan and worked for the Mets, uh, we had a, a little bit of back and forth with that. And when we go to take the picture with her uh, in, front of the, in front of the screen, uh, we had a couple of nice words there as well. And uh, yeah, we just got to chat a little bit there. And then in the overheard segment, it was mostly just me complimenting my two competitors and how great they were and how fast they were on the signaling device. And, and Maya, I'm kind of reaffirming that uh, from her experience seeing people play. But yeah, it was like most people that go to Jeopardy realize you don't get much time with the hosts. And most people that don't play maybe think that you're chatting with them for a half hour beforehand. But really, it's a well-oiled machine. After your game, you know, Maya, Ken, whoever it is, they're back to wardrobe. You know, the, the crew's got to come in, sanitize the set, get the new things in there. So it's not much time for, for, for dinner party chat. But uh, I got to talk with her for a little bit, and she was just lovely. Great person. And, uh, you know, we had some fun banter back and forth. And uh, I wished her well. She wished me well with everything. And I told her maybe we'll see you in the, in the World Series this year, Mets versus Yankees, and then we'll have to re renew our camaraderie. And speaking of contestant interviews, what were some of the other anecdotes you have prepared in case you won more than a single game of Jeopardy? Uh, the big one I had was to talk about my younger brother, uh, Joe, who, when I was younger, I had applied for the teen tournament for Jeopardy. I think I was 14 or 15. And this is back in the year 2000. So uh, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have caller ID. You know, my family didn't subscribe to that or whatever. And there were no emails. So the producers had called after I'd taken a couple of tests, uh, ostensibly at that point in the process, to book me for an appearance on the show. And my younger brother picked up the phone. He was seven or eight at the time. And we forget exactly the circumstances. I think he thought that it was a prank call and he hung up on them. <laughs> he swears that we had a very early cell phone in the family at that point. And it was the cell phones that used to have the, like, the bottom that would flip open and closed. And that he accidentally closed the flap, which hung up the call accidentally. But at that point, you know, they never called back which I thought was weird, but we didn't, it was a private number, so we couldn't call anybody back. And um, yeah, so I, I kind of, I always blamed him. Like he cost me my shot at being on Jeopardy. And I told him that I forgave him eventually, but part of me never really did. But now that I've been on the show uh, anyway, he's off the hook. So that would have been uh, one of my other anecdotes if I made it to, to another day. And then uh, beyond that, probably just talking about some of my travel experiences through Guinness World Records or other records that I had certified in addition to, to Alex's. Those were my, my big stories to tell uh, after that. Now, Mike, I want to walk you and our listeners through your game's box scores. So for those who don't know, since January 12th of this year, Jeopardy has been publishing daily box scores containing stats for each player, including their attempts to buzz in, the number of times a contestant buzzed in successfully, and their percentage of correct responses, just to name a few. 
From the image I'm looking at in front of me, it appears that you, Matea, and Reagan each attempted to buzz in around the same amount of times. 33 for you and Matea, 32 for Reagan. However, the difference maker here was, like we mentioned earlier, the buzz percentage resulting in a close game between Matea and Reagan going into final. Let me tell you, Mike, I don't know if you watched the JNCC back in February, but I got my ass whooped on the buzzer by Raymond, <laughs> who eventually achieved second overall in the tournament. And I did some stat calculation on the 36 of us who were in that tournament. Out of all the quarterfinalists, I had the worst buzz percentage, 31%. Oh, man. Like, it was just demoralizing. <laughs> I was just like, well, that's that's not a record I'm too proud of, but okay. So I know that feeling all too well of knowing the right response but failing to buzz in first. But at the end of the day, I said to myself, I did the best I, that I could under the circumstances I was in. I did all the things suggested to me in Secrets of the Buzzer. And while I didn't win, I still think that the tips provided in that book are invaluable to anyone who wants to be on the show. If I could go back in time, I'd definitely spend the money to buy the $70 practice buzzer that connects to your computer. So any, like, I guess, last thoughts on the buzzer itself? Uh, no, because <laughs> it, was, it, was so it was so mystifying to me. And the fact that I didn't really crack the code, I feel like I, I couldn't give any further advice. But yeah, read the book. And honestly, uh, I think the younger you are, just the, the better advantage you have. I don't consider myself that old. Uh, you know, I'm 36 at the time of this taping. Uh, but when you go up against uh, Matea, I'm pretty sure was 23, Reagan was 19. That's just, it, it's, it's like, it's in sports, right? You watch, you know, Tom Brady being the exception maybe, but even uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, someone that's a physical specimen who's my age or a LeBron James, they're still, they can't keep up with a, a John Morant or, or a Kylian Mbappe just with natural raw athleticism. And I think when it comes to reflexes, as much as you try, as much caffeine as you can take, there's just something to be said for for physiology, right? So I guess my biggest advice is play against people older than you, <laughs> or if you're young, you know, apply for Jeopardy as soon as you can. If you, if you think, oh, I'm only 24, 25, I'm not smart enough, I haven't lived enough, I don't know enough from my life experience to compete on Jeopardy. Uh, no, like throw that out the window. Uh, apply as early as you can, as often as you can, because I think the sooner you get onto the show, uh, the faster you can be buzzing. And then if you're smart enough, you can always study the, the, the knowledge. You can always study the information you have to know. But the buzzing stuff, as much as you practice, there is a bit of a biological clock <laughs> working against you. Uh, that's kind of what I think from my experience. But yeah, like you said, buy the book, do all the things. If you can find a practice buzzer that replicates the real thing, do that. And then, yeah, don't be afraid to switch it up mid-game. You know, I, I tried to find a, a, a thing that worked for me, but going off the voice, going off the lights, and it just didn't, I never found what clicked. And I just wish I had an extra game to figure it out or more rehearsal time, but c'est la vie. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I got to say on the buzzer because I, I couldn't figure it out beyond that. You landed on the first daily double of your game, and it was under computers and the internet for 600. I'm a big advocate for going all in on the first daily double of the game, and I was so glad you did. But I can't tell you how much I was yelling, wallpaper, wallpaper, wallpaper at my TV. Yeah. I know it's easy to answer sitting on your couch at home, but could you explain your thought process in that moment and what might have tripped you up? This, I think, is for sure a generational divide. So a lot of people have reached out to me, even when I was with my watch party. People who I'd say were older than 30, like 2, 33, didn't understand the question. It was, they, they're like, that's a weird wording. And people that have reached out to me on social media, same thing online. Whereas anybody like 30 or younger, even in the audience that day, I went back and I asked people, like, did you guys know that? And almost everyone that was under that age said, yeah, we knew that one. And I think it's just a matter of growing up in an exclusively smartphone age, right? Because to me, wallpaper, in my mind, I only ex exclusively associate that with smartphones, not with computers. Whereas computer, I think of a screensaver the way, you know, when I grew up with Windows 95, or, you know, stuff like that, where you needed that screensaver. And I never thought of wallpapers as a computer thing. So uh, I just, my mind never even went there. And I know they give you, they write in a clue, this home, well, like a home object or something to try and get your brain thinking about it as well. But I just, I had no shot at it at all. And even sometimes there's questions where you don't know the answer and then the host reveals it and you think, ah, yeah, I knew that. Uh, I wouldn't have gotten that if you gave me a hundred tries, probably. So I think that was definitely just a generational thing where uh, you know, I don't think of wallpaper that way. Other people do. And it's one of those where uh, not an if you know, either you know it or you don't. But I think it definitely was against me, uh, my, my life experience with technology in that regard. 
And the last game-related discussion I want to have is in regards to Final Jeopardy. I know you wrote a gag response by acknowledging your <laughs> loss and giving a shout-out to the New York Mets, but I still want to ask if you ever considered the category and clue, or were you dead set on making a lasting impression? Once I did the math calculations and realized that if Matei had bet the way she was supposed to, and she's such a good champ and a smart person that I knew she was going to, that I, I was locked out on the other end, right? I was locked out as a loser, uh, or I wasn't going to win. So once I did that, because I knew... I knew Reagan would have to go all in, and then Matea, what, she would have to bet to at least cover Reagan's all in. If Reagan got it right and Matea got it wrong, would still leave Matea with more money than I had if I went all in and doubled up and got it right. So once I did that math calculation and I knew that I wasn't getting first, then I was dead set on let me at least make an impression, try and you know get a laugh, go viral, give a little shout out to my Mets fan base uh, back home. Uh, and if something disastrous went wrong for Matea, then I would at least still have a little bit of money that maybe I would you know, be the last one standing if they both uh, ended up with nothing. But I knew she wouldn't do that because she's too good of a player. So I didn't even care. Once Mayim read the, the, the clue, I just went right to writing my response because I knew it would take me all 30 seconds. And if you look at the end, my penmanship is not that legible because <laughs> I was scrambling toward the very end. So I didn't even give one second of thought to trying to answer the question or considering it. Um, once I did the math before they revealed the, the clue, uh, I knew right away at that moment that I wasn't going to go for it in earnest. I saw that a couple of Mets fans on Twitter were very happy with your response, and it miraculously coincided with, I believe, the Mets' first win of the regular season. Yeah, with the first game of the regular season, and that was a bit, uh, that was a bit tenuous because at the time we filmed, baseball was still in its lockout, and we weren't sure uh, if opening day was going to happen on time. Back in January, I thought we still did. Uh, but then once they canceled the first week of games and the second week of games, I was like, uh, or the first week, I should say, uh, then I was like, ah, if this continues, then I'm going to maybe look a little bit a little bit dumb with this response and baseball still hasn't started its season yet. But it ended up, like you said, being very fortuitous where opening day of the entire season was the same day as my episode. And uh, if nothing else, yeah, we just got to make a lasting impression. It got a lot of good buzz uh, in Mets universe on Twitter. So now as the season goes on and I get to see more of those fans in person at the stadium this year, uh, I just hope I put a smile on some faces. And if the Mets do win the World Series this year, I think you can say it all started with my final Jeopardy response on day one of the season. I'll take all that credit. Absolutely. Hey, if I were a fan, I'd think you were a prophet of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Let's hope, let's hope so. So after your episode, there were also some discussions on the Jeopardy subreddit about Reagan's suboptimal final Jeopardy wager and how she could have won based on how things played out. Are you familiar with those discussions at all? Was wager strategy or game theory part of your prep process for the show? Very, very cursory part of it. I didn't, I wanted to dedicate more time to the knowledge retention and, and signaling device practice and not clog up too much of my, my RAM and my brain with game theory because you can go down so many rabbit holes. And I figured once I got into the moment, then I would know what to do. So no, and I know there's a lot of people that go a lot more into that, but you only have 30 seconds or so to figure that out on the spot. So I figure all the game theory I could learn, I'm not going to have the time to go through all the permutations in my head. I'm not a math guy. Someone like a James Holzhauer who makes his life on numbers and probability, probably a lot better than that. Me, I was just hoping that it would be an easy enough situation, an obvious enough situation, and I wouldn't have to worry about all that. I did not envy being Reagan and her in her situation. I didn't get a chance to talk to her about her strategy or thought process going into it. I don't think she's on Twitter, so I haven't seen her post episode, you know, discussions on it. But no, I haven't gone into the Reddit or the subreddit or any of that stuff because uh, for me, once the episode was over, I kind of just, you know, washed my hands of it. It was a great experience and I, I didn't want to live too much and all that, those webs of it. But yeah, I know a lot of people, for them, it's a huge part of the game. I know some people have written entire books about how you should bet on Final Jeopardy and there's entire websites dedicated to it, but that was never really a huge part of my preparation process. And it uh, turns out it didn't have to be. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because my game, I ended up being in a lock game where first place was out of reach and I had no chance of getting first. So most of the wager theory practice that I did pretty much went to waste. So I could only you know, do wager theory in order to like try to get second. But yeah, unfortunately I didn't get to utilize it as much. And I, made, I actually made it a big part of my um, my preparation process i remember the days like while i was in la i was in my um my hotel room like writing on flashcards like oh the different final jeopardy scenarios from like the past like few couple of syndicated shows and i was prepared for like literally any situation i was just like all right i'm definitely not losing if i'm in like in this situation but 
hey, what can you do? Yeah, that's that's kind of what, it, unless you win, it all comes down to what are you going to do? That's kind of what sums it all up for the Jeopardy experience. Yeah, so for those listening who don't know, in a final Jeopardy of Mike's game, uh, it was a triple stumper, meaning none of the contestants got final Jeopardy right. Mike, who was third going into final, was incorrect, lost seven, dropped to 1793. Reagan, who was in second going into final, was also incorrect, lost all of her money, 11,600, dropped down to zero. And finally, Matea, who was in first going into final, was incorrect, lost 6,801, and dropped down to 9,599, making her a three-day Jeopardy champion. What people are arguing about online is the fact that Reagan would have won had she wagered no more than 2,000. Because Matea and Reagan's scores were so close, the only way Reagan could win is if Matea got Final Jeopardy wrong. Assuming Matea wagers enough to beat Reagan's doubled score plus one, like Mike said earlier, which she did, uh, Reagan would be able to beat Matea by at least a dollar. She'd win with either 9,600 if she was wrong or 13,600 if she was right. On the other hand, not everyone who gets on Jeopardy like Mike also said, is equipped with that sort of advanced knowledge. For example, Jeopardy! Ultra Champion Amy Schneider had no clue about wager theory, yet went on to win 40 consecutive games because she was just that dominant. Some people yeah. are on the show to fulfill a lifelong dream or to simply have a good time and win big money in the process. So I totally get why Reagan would want to maximize her winnings, especially as a college student, 19 years old. Mike, did you expect that big wager to come out from Reagan? And I know it's only a thousand dollar difference, but how surprised were you to play second in your episode and take home, you know, 2K? <laughs> It's a thousand dollar difference, but a silver medal over a bronze, I'll take it. No, I mean, for me, that, that wasn't part of my thinking at all. I think also part of her calculus was that Matea was just such a good champ, and we'd seen her in person the last two nights do so well. And so I think Reagan was going in with the assumption that Matea was going to get uh, that Final Jeopardy question right. And Matea had shown a real good, a real good ability in those kind of questions, you know, 20th century, you know, stuff. What was the final category was inventions, I think, right? Yeah. And I think that was something that Matea showed a great aptitude for throughout all of her games. So I think Reagan partly was also just scouting her opponent and assuming Matea is going to get it right. And so my only chance is to try and double up and hope that she, uh, you know, doesn't bet enough to cover me. I don't know. It's, it's something that I, I wish I could speculate on further, but only Reagan knows what she was thinking. And whether or not she was a game theory person or not, or uh, you know she did the math or not, I, I have no clue, um, to be honest. But then, like you said, maybe part of it was wanting to maximize the winnings. College is expensive, and yeah. when you're 19, you don't have a lot of money, so that could be part of it too. Um, I wish I could say more, but anything beyond that would just really be speculation on my part. So moving away from talking about your game, what aspect of the Jeopardy contestant experience surprised you the most, or was there anything that you weren't expecting or lack thereof? Honestly, I mean, I don't know if this is gameplay or not, but just the, the speed of having to, to signal in for me was such, even with the practice, was just so surprising. You know, people know now if you're any kind of a Jeopardy fan that there is this light string of LED lights around the board that activates whenever the buzzing uh, window opens. And like, they're just so, they're so fast. Uh, and, and, and before you even know it, the, the opportunity to, to hit your signaling device is gone. And then the only other thing I guess that surprised me too was that when they reveal, when you're there in person and you see the game board and they reveal the clue, it, it only like it's revealed in that size of the screen of where it is on the board, right? And for me, I thought it would be bigger maybe, I guess. And like, I don't use contacts or glasses, but I had LASIK surgery. This has been 15 years ago now. So my eyes aren't as sharp as they used to be. And I found myself like squinting a little bit sometimes. And I'm sure that didn't help uh, my brain recognition. So uh, realizing that uh, I made some weird faces looking off to the side of the screen, <laughs> which a lot of people didn't know, didn't know. That's where they have a monitor that shows you any video or picture clues. Uh, so like my brother was like, why are you looking away from the camera like that? I'm like, oh, because that's where they show you the video clue. So little things like that that you don't see on TV that you don't realize until you get there. I, I think were, were definitely surprises to me. And even to my point earlier, I had been on the set before, but I was so overwhelmed by the moment that I wasn't looking at how things were set up to know, oh, this is how it works for if I ever get back here as a player. So when I did get back there as a player, it was almost as if I'd been there for the very first time. 
And uh, yeah, that, that stuff uh, caught, me off, <laughs> caught me off guard a little bit. Do you have any other behind the scenes stories you'd like to share with our listeners? Maybe something funny that happened when the cameras weren't rolling? Nothing in particular. I think uh, the, the two other main things that surprised me, I guess, is uh, you know Jimmy from the Clue Crew is the, the stage manager and he gets his credit at the end of every episode. I don't think a lot of people know that, but he's there all day. He's the one telling people, all right, get into place, camera people, you get on your mark. Like he's the one, all right, let's start this rehearsal. Okay, let's start this game. He's the one directing traffic all day long. And so he's there. He's there. If you're a Clue Crew fan from years gone by, um, he's just great. And he's, he's there to chat and he's got free time. So you might not be able to talk to the host, but, you know, Jimmy is there and he's a great, you know, part of Jeopardy lore too. And he's just a great guy, like an awesome guy. And just being able to chat with him was, was a really cool part of the experience. And uh, the wardrobe department, they do not love uh, the all black outfits. I think I brought an all black outfit in case I got far enough because I think it looks good. It looks slimming. It's very intimidating, right? Uh, but they called. They said something like, "Oh, another funeral director look." So, <laughs> like, well, like, they're very fashionable people. So I think the all black they don't really appreciate, and they like more pastels, jewel tones, things that pop. So if you ever are going on Jeopardy, if all black is your thing, by all means go for it. But just expect uh, from these very fashion savvy people, maybe a, a little bit of, a, of an eye roll, but they'll <laughs> accept it of course, but maybe they'll prefer something that's a, a little bit more, uh, you know, standing off the page. Have you read any messages or reactions from randoms on social media? Has anyone from your distant past suddenly reached out to congratulate you? And if so, do you mind sharing some more, the more memorable interactions with our listeners? I've had a ton and, I, and I've read them all. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's something about my career that, you know, social media is a huge part of it. And a lot of people that go on Jeopardy don't want the public to really be reaching out to them, but I encourage it because it's part of building uh, my my marketability and my popularity with people and stuff like that as a content creator. So uh, for me, you know, I did like an AMA on my Twitter. I did a, a similar thing on my Instagram story. So I, I love people reaching out with questions and, and things that I could answer. I love to. And I tried to get to everybody and I think I saw every message. Apologies to anyone listening that feels slighted by me if I, if I missed it. I was up till like 2.30 in the morning the night of my episode airing trying to get everybody. But uh, you do get a little bit bleary eyed after a certain point. And not just literally people, you know, and having been so many places travel wise and also work wise, you know, I've worked in California, I've worked in both Carolinas, Alaska, like I told you before, Massachusetts, New York. You know, I used to do play by play for a minor league baseball team in North Carolina 14 years ago, and I'd have people, I had, you know, the, the, the station director of the radio station that aired our games, who I haven't talked to since 2009, reaches out, oh, my wife and I were watching the other night, and I thought I remembered that name, and yeah, it was you, congratulations, you know, stuff like that, and just a lot of people sending a lot of support from uh, all different chapters of my life, uh, it was very much kind of a Forrest Gump situation, just remembering all these places I've been, and people I've interacted with, and, um, you know, folks from high school that I haven't talked to since graduation uh, almost 20 <laughs> years ago, uh, saying, well, I can't believe it's you or whatever. I always knew you'd make it on the show kind of stuff. And it was just really cool uh, to know that people still remember you and still care enough about you to reach out. So yeah, it, it was great. And I really appreciate all the love and the support that's come my way. Yeah, getting back to everyone, I remember when my episode aired, I, I think it took me a total of like 48 hours after my episode aired to get like get back to every single like person that I knew that like reached out and said, hey, congrats. And I said, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Same thing over and over. Did you get any stray thirst tweets at all or anybody like trying to slide <laughs> into your DMs? Because I noticed that's been a trend with like people who have been on the show um, recently? Yeah, uh, mostly on Instagram. I got a few, I got a few folks coming in uh, you know, saying, oh, you look so handsome. Uh, I live <laughs> in the New York area. would love to meet up for drinks sometimes. Um, you know, stuff like that. You're the best dresser I've seen all season, uh, that kind of stuff. So very flattering, uh, but I am, I am a spoken for man. So while I appreciate all the advances, uh, I am off the market. So <laughs> it makes you feel It makes you feel good. It makes you feel a little bit flattering. Yeah. And, uh, thankfully, you know, it didn't go to any like harassment areas or stuff like that. I know a lot of contestants, especially women contestants deal with so much stuff yeah. online that they do not deserve and they should not have to deal with at all. So it's easy for me as like a straight white guy to kind of laugh it off and say, oh, it's, you know, some, these are thirst tweets or DMs and it's, it's easy to, to, to brush those off. But a lot of people uh, do deal with a lot, lot worse. So if you are one of those people that reaches out and, and may be, you know, harassing, don't, you know, just treat people with respect, please. Um, but thankfully, I didn't have to deal with anything, uh, you know, besides just a, a random, uh, hey, what's up here or there kind of thing. 
as we slowly wrap up here, Mike, you're actually the first non-winner from the syndicated show that I've interviewed on Post Podium, which oh, truth so be I told, won that, at least. <laughs> truth be told, isn't exactly the highest honor, but someone like you was in a unique position that a champion otherwise wouldn't be able to relate to. And I think you sharing your story would be insightful for, or perhaps even a cautionary tale for future contestants listening as well. Does that sound all right to you? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so for anyone who gets called to be on Jeopardy, a contestant must pay for their travel and lodging expenses leading up to and after taping. None of the costs incurred as it relates to being on the show are paid for by Sony Pictures, unlike in a tournament setting like the JNCC. Because of this, the consolation prizes of 1000 for third and 2000 for second aren't enough to reimburse non-winning contestants unless you live near Culver City. Therefore, I think it's super important to savor the experience for what it is because it truly is once in a lifetime. You're also taking time off from other life commitments, and I feel like the last thing you'd want to feel after being on a game show is bitterness and regret upon return to normal. Personally, I agree with those saying that the minimum prize money should be raised. Jeopardy has given away the same consolation prizes since 2002, and I think it's about time to increase that amount, even if it's to keep up with the rate of inflation. If that's not possible, I feel like at the very least they could, the least they could do is pay for your accommodations so that you keep most of your consolation prize. So, Mike, again, if you don't mind me asking, was 2,000 perhaps even less when you consider taxes enough to fund your trip to Los Angeles? And do you think Jeopardy should do more to compensate its contestants? Uh, it was enough for me. I mean, I was able to get a, a decent enough flight and I flew direct and even with the hotel and everything and, and the lifts all considered, I, I still ended up, you know, pocketing a little bit extra. Um, and for me, I considered it, even if it was a slight net loss or a break even point, just the opportunity to be on the show. You know, a lot of people would pay money out of their pocket mm. to be a contestant on Jeopardy if they could. So I think that's part of the, the calculus as well. Uh, but it ended up being for me, and I, I'm coming from about as far as you can uh, to get out to L.A. from New York. Uh, but it ended up being uh, not something that was a, a financial loss for me. Um, yeah, it, it's tricky, right? We see this with everything from minimum wage to, uh, I guess, Jeopardy prize money is when do you raise things to go along with the times uh, where expenses keep going higher, but maybe wages don't over time. Uh, that's something that, you know, Michael Davies has shown a, a great uh, aptitude for new ideas and taking new things under consideration under his reign. Uh, second chance tournament, uh, putting out the box score every day, you know, the overheard segment, all new things that are, are great additions to the show and expanding it. And maybe that's something that, that he and, and his team would consider. Uh, anytime that there's more money available for people and players, I'm always down for that, right? Anytime <laughs> you can get more money into people's hands, why not? But I also think if Jeopardy decides to keep it where it is, I think that's also good too, because for a lot of people, being on the show is prize enough. And uh, if the money is enough to cover your expenses to get there, uh, then that's, that, that's a good day's work as well. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, they're definitely gonna be open to any kind of uh, suggestions or, or thoughts about it. And hey, maybe if enough people like you keep beating the drum, maybe somebody, <laughs> maybe somebody will listen. Yeah, I think with Davies being the new AP, he's definitely bringing some fresh ideas to the table. I really like the direction the show is going now that he's at like the helm of the ship. And yeah, who knows? Maybe maybe they will raise the prize money in like a year or two, maybe five. I don't know. With that, that brings us to the end of our interview. Thank you so much, Mike, for coming onto the podcast to talk about your career in media and contestant experience on Jeopardy. Hopefully our listeners or Jeopardy hopefuls were able to learn something new about not only what it takes to be on the show, but also what a taping day is like. Congratulations once again on your Jeopardy contestant debut. And before we sign off, where can people find you online? Is there anything or anyone you'd like to plug or shout out? Go right ahead. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, follow me on social. Would love to interact with people, whether it's Jeopardy related, sports related, MCU, Star Wars related, you know, anything. I'm, I'm a multifaceted personality. So would love to hear from you guys. I'm, it's just my name, at Mike Janella, uh, J-A-N-E-L-A. That's on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, I don't do Facebook or, or Snapchat or TikTok. Uh, I'm an older millennial, so I, I found my two social media platforms and I stick with them. Um, and then also, uh, if anybody's ever looking for any, any coaching advice for content creation or being on camera, I run a talent coaching business, Mike Janella Media. It's just MikeJanellaMedia.com. So if you're an aspiring TV host and uh, you want some breakdown on your previous work or you want some coaching on how to get better. If you want some game show preparation coaching, I've been on two of them now. I won 
everything you could on one. I finished second on another. Uh, so I kind of know how to go through the process. Uh, anybody that's, you know, would like any thoughts on that personally, uh, one on one, I offer that too. So, um, and a bunch of other stuff, podcasts you can listen to, uh, courses you can take that are on demand, uh, a lot of different price points for your, your level of comfort and, and ability. So yeah, just uh, at Mike Janella on social and then Mike Janella Media if anybody wants to uh, learn a little bit from me and all the experience I've gone through professionally. Uh, look forward to hearing from you guys. And thanks for having me on the show. Great. Thank you. And now this is when I close out the show by asking you to please rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to. Post Podium is now available on all sorts of listening platforms, including Amazon Music, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Stitcher. So make sure to follow and subscribe for the latest episodes. I've been your host, Jarek Ruel. And remember, if someone asks what you're listening to, always phrase your response in the form of a question. What is Post Podium? See you next time. Thank you.